Maid's properties in the custom script that you write. Um, and one of the real benefits of that is you have access to animation curves and keyframing and all these sorts of things, which are they're both powerful, but they're also much more artist friendly. So if you're creating a tool that you then want to hand off to a level designer or something like that, it's relatively easy for him then to just tweak some curves or add some keyframes. He's not necessarily have to worry about esoteric numbers or certain things like that. So I agree. <laughs> you know, so you know, a lot of a lot of making games is making it easier for other people on your team. So. My, uh, since that first that first demo was relatively maybe longer than I would have liked, I'm going to go ahead and forego the second demo from this guy because it's kind of I feel like we got the we got the idea of some of the power of the animator. So imagine a jump scare. Point number three. So uh, working with middleware. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean Unity plugins, um, but it certainly can. Um, I'm referring more specifically to how we create the content that we put in our games. Um, probably all familiar with, you know, your Photoshop or uh, Amaya or 3D Studio Max. But there are a lot of there are a lot of tools that are very powerful that can allow you to create some pretty pretty amazing effects and relatively quickly too. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, come back over here. Uh, so two that I'm going to talk about for this are um, Spine and Houdini. Um, first Spine, that one's relatively easy for me to show off because my character was made relatively quickly in it. So I've got this character and they have a rig, just like a 3D character. It's all for a 2D character. Um, this is very helpful because I only have to make one illustration. And as long as I prepare it correctly, then I can animate it to do whatever it is I need it to do. So if we scale in here, just so it's easier to see. How do we? Um, it'll be a little, little pixelated. You see, she can have idle animations, she has like a moving animation where her hair kind of flips around faster and her skirt's doing cool stuff. Um, but if I wanted to, if I actually look at my character, she has in here a full skeleton that I can attach objects to, behaviors to, I can drive through scripts. Um, I gave her, I just put like a particle system on here that creates those little, those little red like poofs that come off of the, that come off the little jet in her back. So it's an easy way to add detail as well. Um, so for the other part of this, I'm going to, let's go ahead and uh, turn this into a little bit more of a, more of a game. I'm going to turn on my, and, my asteroid box. This is a simple behavior that creates these asteroid models and at a semi-random semi interval. So you see that they can fly in there, those are all the physics objects. So I can, my gun, as you can see, uh, when it hits something, it actually uh, has a little, uh, Little explosive poof, just a quick little. And that, uh, that little explosive effect I made in, uh, made, made in Houdini relatively quickly. Now, Houdini is a uh, piece of software that's used uh, in the film industry a great deal, but it's uh, being used more and more in games. And uh, the premise of it is that it's entirely procedural. There's no, so it, it is. One step on top of another is completely non-destructive, so you can always go back into the chain and change something and come to the full suite of fluid dynamics, fire dynamics, hair simulation, all sorts of everything. 
it's the movie magic in movie magic, right? Um, so for my purposes, to make something for a game, um, I went ahead and created just a simple, a simple fluid uh, simulation. And I created a spreadsheet. Um, So you can see it's pretty, pretty simple. But when we come in here and we use it, sometimes when we make things in another piece of software, uh, it sort of gets obfuscated by your pipeline. So if you need to change something, it's a huge pain. Oh yeah, she's getting attacked by attacked by those guys. You know, so I've got this explosion, but. Eh, it takes a while to pop out, and I feel like it could probably look yeah, look a little look a little nicer. And so this is the thing. This is an area where uh, Unity can be very powerful. So I've got an explosion prefab. Here, let's pull this out of here so I can so I can work on it. So you can see how that, so you can see how that looks. And it's, so it has like this really slow sort of build up here. You know, it's got like six, five or six frames. And really, I really wish that was like two. You know, because when the, when, when the explosion happens, that has a great deal of impact. You know, we talked about um, basically contrast and motion uh, create impact when they draw the eye. So we don't actually want this to be too smooth. All right, I'm not going to go all the way back to Houdini and adjust this fluid simulation and re-simulate it out and re-render it and recreate. Like that's just it's too it's too much. So instead, we'll go ahead and just do it here in a. We'll just do it here in a, in Unity. It's really relatively simple. So we know that we've got too many too many frames. I basically want like this. To be frame two. Well, that's simple enough, right? We can just, we can just delete them. So now it's, it's going to go. See, that, that first frame is a little bit of nothing, though. We want one frame to sort of lead our eye into the big explosion. So I'm actually going to undo that. Let's find a better first frame. That guy's probably because it goes like actually yeah. we'll go that guy. So instead I'll delete these guys. There we go. So that's gonna go it's boom into the explosion like like immediately. Right? It would be kind of nice if I do wish it maybe trailed off a little bit slower. So another thing that's nice in uh, some of the newer <coughs> versions of Unity, you can select keyframes, and you've got these nice little ears here on the side. You can actually drag out time to readjust time. Here. So now it hits, and then it kind of fades out a little bit, a little bit slower. So then if maybe you wanted to, uh, you could add a simple particle system in there. You could, you could make a separate copy of it with slightly different timings on a lower opacity to give sort of the impression of the motion blur. Um, there's a couple of like very simple things you can do to recycle the asset you already have. Because you don't want to have to go back and make it work. Because it's probably too much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I am a firm believer in making it all myself. And a lot of that, so, so if you want something to look, like a lot of these things are basically polished details. Like the, everything's about just making things look a little, a little bit more polished. And one of the biggest things to make something look not polished is an inconsistent art style. So you can look at something like a, 
Kirby's Epic Yarn. It's a game made entirely out of yarn, but it's consistently made entirely out of yarn. That makes it an art style. If one part was made out of yarn, and the other part looked like regular Kirby, and another part looked like something out of Uncharted, it would be a mess, <laughs> right? <laughs> but when you're buying things off the asset store, that's exactly what you're doing. Because there's no coherent art direction between elements, unless you're specifically buying from one dude who's like, here's my fantasy thing, right? Fantasy world, buy all the assets. Cool, but so did everybody else. And so you still have three games out there that look just like yours. Um, when making your game, it's so much of it is about differentiation, standing out from the crowd, like being 